Time is a very difficult thing to pin down. There's a famous saying of St. Augustine of Hippo that when he was asked, what is time? He said, I know what it is, but when you ask me, I don't. And yet it seems absolutely fundamental to our life. Time is money, we say. I don't have enough time. Time flies. Time drags. And I think we should go into the question of what this is because in our ordinary common sense we think of time as a one-way motion from the past through the present and on into the future. And that carries along with it another impression which is to say that life moves from the past to the future in such a way that what happens now and what will happen is always the result of what has happened in the past. In other words, we seem to be driven along. You know, once upon a time it was fashionable in psychology for people to speak of man's and animal's instincts. That we have, for example, an instinct for survival an instinct to make love, and so on. But nowadays that word has become unfashionable and psychologists tend instead to use the word drives and to speak of the need for food as a drive, the need for survival or for sex as drives. And that's a very significant word because it's brought out, isn't it, by people who feel driven. I must say personally, if I feel hungry, I don't feel driven. Also, if I feel lusty, I don't feel driven. Because I don't say, oh, excuse me, but I have to eat. Or excuse me, but I need to fulfill my sexual urges, my biological impulses. I say, hooray, I identify myself with my drives. They're me and I don't take a passive attitude towards them and apologize for them. So the whole idea of our being driven is connected with the idea of causality, of life moving under the power of the past. And that is so ingrained in our common sense that it's very difficult to get rid of it because I want to turn the thing round completely the other way and say that the past is the result of the present. Let us suppose, just for the sake of example, that this universe started with a big bang, as some cosmologists believe. Now, when that bang happened, it was the present, wasn't it? And so the, the universe began in what we will call a now moment. Then it goes on doing its stuff. And always when any event that we now call past came into being, it came into being in the present and out of the present. That's one way of seeing it. But before we get further involved in this, I want to draw your attention to a fallacy in the very common sense idea of causality. That events are caused by previous events from which they flow or result necessarily. To understand the fallacy of that idea, we have to begin by asking, what do you mean by an event? Let's take the event of a human being coming into the world. Now, when does that event begin? Does it occur at the moment of parturition, when the baby actually comes out of its mother? Or does the baby begin at the moment of conception? Or does the baby begin when it was an evil gleam in its father's eye? Or does a baby begin when uh, the spermatozoa 
are generated in the father or the ovum in the mother. Or could you say a baby begins when its father is born or when its mother is born? All these things can be thought of as beginnings. But we decide for purposes of legal registration that a life begins at the moment of parturition. And that is a purely arbitrary decision. And it has validity only because we all agree about it. Let me show you the same phenomenon in the dimension of space instead of the dimension of time. Let's ask, how big is the sun? Are we going to define the sun as limited by the extent of its fire? That's one possible definition. But we could equally well define the sphere of the sun by the extent of its heat. We could also define the sphere of the sun by the extent of its light. And each of these would be reasonable choices, except that it's rather difficult to keep track of the extent of its light because we're inside it. And therefore we have arbitrarily agreed to define the sun by the limit of its visible fire. But you will see in all these, by, by, by these analogies, that how big a thing is or how long an event is, is simply a matter of definition. Now therefore, when by simple definition for purposes of discussion, we have divided events into certain periods, we'll say the First World War began in 1914 and it ended in 1918. Now actually, all those things which led up to the First World War started long before 1914, and the repercussions of that war have continued long beyond 1918. How are we to distinguish an event from its repercussions? So you will see that because we have divided events from one another in this arbitrary way, we do that and then we sort of forget we did it. And then we have a puzzle. How do events lead to each other? Because, you see, in reality, there are no separate events. Life moves along like water. And it's all connected as the source of a river is connected to the mouth and to the ocean. And all the events or things going on are like whirlpools in the stream. Because you go there today and you see a whirlpool. You go there tomorrow and you see a whirlpool. But it isn't the same whirlpool because all the water is changing every second. What is happening is not really what we should call a whirlpool, but rather a whirlpooling. It is an activity, not a thing. And indeed, every so-called thing can be called an event. We call, say, a house, housing. We call a mat, matting. And we could equally call a cat a catting. So we could say the catting sat on the matting. And we would thereby have a world in which there were no things but only events. To give another illustration, a flame is something we say there is a flame on the candle. But it would be more correct to say there is a flaming on the candle because the flame is a stream of hot gas. Let's take another amusing example. We say fist. And fist is a noun. And fist looks like a thing, but suddenly what happens to the fist when I open my hand? See, I was fisting. Now I'm handing. Handing it to you. So every kind of so-called thing can be spoken of as an event. And because events flow into each other, the fisting flows into the handing, we cannot say exactly where one ends and the other begins. So therefore, if we remember that, we shall see that we do not need the idea of causality to explain how a prior event influences a following event, because it's like this. Supposing I'm looking through a narrow slit in a fence and a snake goes by. 
I've never seen a snake before, and this is mysterious. And I see through the slit in the fence, first the snake's head. Then I see a long trailing body, and then finally the tail. I say, well, that was interesting. Then the snake turns round and goes back. And again, I see first the head, and then after an interval, the tail. Now, if I call the head one event and the tail another, it will seem to me that the event head is the cause of the event tail. And the tail is the effect. But if I look at the whole snake, I will see a head-tailed snake, and it would be simply absurd to say that the head of the snake is the cause of the tail, as if the, head came, as if the snake came into being, first the head and then the tail. The snake comes into being out of its egg as a head-tailed snake. And so in exactly the same way, all events are really one event. We're looking, when we talk about different events, we're looking at different sections or parts of one continuous happening.